choir, and thanks be to God. So before we have our second reading, just a few things. First of all, I apologize if I cough or sneeze at any point throughout uh, this sermon or the rest of the service. I've had kind of a scratchy throat all week long. I have taken multiple COVID tests. They have all come back negative. Other than that, I feel just fine. I'm pretty sure I just have the good old Kentucky crud uh, that we all, many of us get this time of year when things uh, start to warm up. So uh, secondly, Danny and Melody, welcome back from Florida. Great, grateful to have you all uh, with us. We've missed you all uh, dearly. Grateful to have you all with us. Uh, and also, I uh, please disregard the sermon title that's printed in your bulletin, uh, as sometimes happens as preachers uh, decide to change the topics of, of our sermons. I'm staying with uh, the scripture that is in your sermon, but based off of uh, a wider conversation that we're having about the future of this con congregation, um, I decided to change the kind of the direction of the sermon. So I did want to say... Uh, Go ahead and let you all know that in this sermon, I will, speaking, I will be speaking hopefully both very bluntly and also very pastorally about the challenges that this congregation and, frankly, so many others are having uh, right now in this world where mainline denominations are decreasing, uh, decreasing uh, and then COVID. So I just want to let you all know that this sermon is going to be very blunt, but hopefully there will be a word of encouragement and know that every word uh, is given with love. So let's turn our attention to what God is saying to God's church. Uh, I'm actually going to skip the first paragraph that you all see uh, in, in your bulletin. If you want to go out for a beer sometime this week and chat about that, let me know. Uh, but for the purposes of this sermon, uh, I will be preaching um, from just the parable of, of the fig tree. Uh, Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. Let us listen again for what God is saying to God's church. <clears throat> and then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down why should it be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. And if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Friends, holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today I want to tell you all a story, or for some of us perhaps remind us of a story of a fig tree named Beaumont Presbyterian Church. And while this parable, which seen through the lens of this congregation, which you and I love so very much, might be a tender topic. Rest assured that there are many other congregations in the world right now, even here in Lexington, that are living this parable of uncertainty right now. I wonder, as your preacher, what this parable might have to tell us as we navigate a post, uh, discover what a post-COVID world might look like for this community. So let's remind ourselves how we got to where we are right now. A fig tree was planted right here on the ground upon which we sit in 1959. It was planted by a group of people from Second Presbyterian Church on Main Street downtown. You see, before the 1950s, this part of town, I'm told, wasn't developed. It was farm country, it was horse country, and of course before that it belonged to the indigenous people who were the original stewards of this land. But in the 1950s, Lexington was growing out into this part of the country. In 1956, IBM broke ground on their new plant, and the workers of that development started building homes right here in this neighborhood. And so, because of that, the fig tree known as Beaumont Presbyterian Church was planted right here 
uh, about 63 years ago in 1959. And that fig tree blossomed and the fruit began to grow through the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. It was summertime and the living was easy. Young families were plentiful. The money was flowing. The bodies filled the pews. In fact, the bodies were filling the pews in this sanctuary so much that I believe in the 1990s they expanded this sanctuary right if you see those cameras up above your head that's where the original back of this sanctuary used to be in the 1990s there were so many people in this congregation that they broke down that wall and pushed this sanctuary back made it bigger and built in uh, more offices where they currently are but in addition to the importance of the IBM jobs, so many of those families were the families that began this church, there were other factors in the fig tree flourishing. Frankly, in those days, I don't remember those days, I was born in 1988, but back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and into the 90s, going to church was the socially popular and profitable thing to do. If you were a business owner, it's where you found your clients. If you were a local politician, it's where you found your votes. If you were parents of young children, it's where you found friends for you and for your children. You went to church because it was, well, just what you did. But then around the turn of the century, something shifted. The church started to see its social influence slip away. You can argue whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. Let's buy a beer together sometime and we can hash that out. But the fact is the church began to see some of its influence slip away. Generations that grew up in the church uh, didn't return to it. Many in my generation and others became disillusioned with the institution, with institutions in general but also the institution of the church. They were upset that the church spent so much money on the building or on music or on staff salaries or whatever else and not enough on mission and social justice. Some folks began to think that the church was just so inwardly uh, focused that they decided to give their dollars and their time and their energy to other nonprofits that didn't have to worry about propping up aging buildings and staff salaries. Other families left the church because their kids just had too many extracurricular activities and the fig tree of the church just didn't give them a compelling enough reason to prioritize um, their time with the church. Now the reasons for the diminishing numbers across mainline denominations such as ours are many and complex, but the fig tree known as Beaumont Presbyterian Church wasn't immune to what was going on in the wider context of the church and in the country. If you want to explore this further, I highly recommend a book by Phyllis Tickle uh, called The Great Emergence. I've got a copy here if anybody wants to borrow it. She makes the case that if you step back and look at the wider story of the history of Christianity, that Christianity goes through a seismic shift about every 500 years. Does anybody know what happened approximately 500 years ago in Christianity? The Reformation. Fast forward 500 years and guess what? We are in the middle of another seismic shift. So the size and the influence of the fig tree known as Beaumont Presbyterian Church, as best as I can tell, reached its peak sometime in the 1990s, right, when, we, when they did that expansion. But for the past 20, 25 years or so, this congregation, like so many other congregations, has been shrinking. But here's the problem. Though the congregation has diminished, the size of our building and our grounds has not and by and large, the amount of money we spend on our staff salaries hasn't either. And another part of the story of this church is about 10 or so years ago, give or take a few, the Lauderdale bequest came in, right? It was a seven-figure financial gift that was given to this congregation that bought the fig tree some time. But that time is quickly running out. And then COVID happened and made that time run out even faster and here we are. We, the stewards of the fig tree, 
known as Beaumont Presbyterian Church, find ourselves, like so many other congregations, in a very difficult position. Over the past few decades, a shrinking group of people have increasingly been burdened by propping up an institution and its building and staffing model that were designed for numbers far greater than the numbers we see sitting in the pews right now. People are dying, people are moving away, and there's just not enough people willing to step into leadership positions and to fill in their spots. And here's, I really want you all to hear this. This, for me, is probably one of the most painful truths about this parable. The fig tree of Beaumont Presbyterian Church is still producing fruit, right? We're doing some really good things. Last year, we provided a safe place for a young adult LGBT congregation to be who God delights in them to be, right? That's a big thing. We've cared for each other throughout this difficult time of a global pandemic. I sat down with the session at Beth Alexander's home a few days ago and reminded them just how proud I am of this congregation and how you all stayed connected and prioritized the safety of, of your neighbors and your wider community. I'm so proud of you all. We're producing fruit by feeding people through our blessing brocks. We are producing <coughs> fruit by continuing to gather uh, in worship and preaching a gospel of grace and inclusivity. We sing. We make melody. The fig tree of Beaumont Presbyterian Church is still producing fruit. But here's the rub. That fruit is no longer adequate to sustain our current model. It's not enough to maintain our building and our grounds, and it's not enough to maintain our staff salaries beyond about another five years or so. And as I said at the beginning of this sermon, there are many fig tree congregations having this conversation right now. And as best as I can tell, it's the small to middle-sized suburban congregations like ours that are struggling the most. By and large, the larger downtown congregations, they're doing fine. Sure, they have their problems, but their steeple gets broken, and a rich lawyer can write a six-figure check for the tax deduction, and they're going to be just fine. Some of the smaller rural churches in the more rural parts of our presbytery, well, they have their struggles too, but they're doing okay because they're small churches. They're used to being small. They've always been small. But it's the churches like us that have been larger and are now much smaller that are struggling the most. Meadowthorpe Presbyterian is in a similar place. Beaumont Pres here. Hunter Presbyterian, the former congregations of Chapel Hill uh, and Nicholasville Presbyterian Church. These are the congregations that have had the hardest time. And a few weeks ago, we had a congregational meeting to address yet again these difficulties and what to do about it. Your session, uh, we met at Beth Alexander's house, as I mentioned last week, to continue our discernment. Uh, we will be uh, meeting again in a few weeks. Please, please, please pray for your session members as we hold this weighty conversation and seek to be faithful to God, faithful to you all as a congregation who have elected us to lead. And in the midst of this uncertainty, we have this story of a fig tree, a fig tree that isn't producing the fruit it used to. And we have two different people in this parable with two different opinions about how to move forward, right? We have the landowner and we have the gardener. And I think it's important to note that both the landowner and the gardener want the same thing. What do they want? They want fruit, right? They, they share that goal. They both want fruitfulness, but they differ on how to go about it. The landowner thinks that the fig tree has had its chance, has lived out its life, and is, is just no longer viable. So the landowner says it's time to cut it down, it's time to free up that soil so that something else uh, can be fruitful in its place. But the gardener has another plan. The gardener says, "What? wait a second, I, the, the fig tree still has a chance. The gardener tells the landowner to give him uh, another year so that he can try something different, uh, to, to do something different, to dig around the soil, get some more oxygen in it, put some, uh, bring it back to life, put some manure on it, give it some new nutrients. To be clear, the gardener isn't simply kicking the can down the road and doing the same thing and hoping for different results. As has often been said, that's the very definition of what? Insanity, right? 
But the gardener calls for change. Change that hopefully will yield fruit again. Maybe a different kind of fruit, who knows, but fruitfulness. And so a very broad generalization is that congregations such as ours have, uh, have a choice to make. Will we take the way of the landowner or will we take the way of the gardener? Bo- either or both, either could be faithful choices, right? I'm not lifting up one over the other. Um, so, for example, the way of the landowner is one way that we can look at the decisions of the former congregations of Chapel Hill and Nicholasville Presbyterian Church. Chapel Hill, and we've got some former Chapel Hill members uh, that, that are now members of, of this church, they decided that it was time to let go of that congregation, to give thanks for all it did in Christ's name, and then give its building to someone who needed it more. And in fact, um, as I said, several Chapel Hill uh, members are now members here, and even one of them is currently serving on our session, Janice Schaefer. But today, as the result of that congregation's discernment, The building that housed the people who were Chapel Hill Presbyterian Church is now the building for a local uh, Korean Presbyterian congregation that's thriving. And the landowner option is also similar to what the folks of Nicholasville Presbyterian Church decided to do. They, too, decided that it was time to bring their ministry to an end, and they still had a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank, so they gave it to the presbytery to fund a future missional development in Nicholasville. And because of that gift, our own youth director, Jeff Shaver, is working as we speak to build a community center uh, in downtown Nicholasville to build community through, because it's Jeff, mixed martial arts and physical fitness. So those are two examples of the landowner option. The other option is the gardener option. The gardener decides to do something different, which might entail making some very difficult decisions, such as whether or not to sell our building and or change our staffing model. This model would take very seriously the idea that Beaumont Presbyterian Church was never the building. I applaud Erica Horn, who at our congregational meeting a few weeks ago had the courage to ask the following question. What do we love more, the building or the congregation? Yes, this building has been a tremendous gift. It has been a place where for the last 63 years we have gathered to worship and pray, sing and play, eat and learn, weep and laugh. But the building, as well as a gift, is also an increasing burden for a budget that has been trimmed back as much as we can. And though some of us struggle to fathom what Beaumont Presbyterian Church would look like without this building, I assure you, a fig tree doesn't need a building. If nothing else, COVID taught us that. In fact, now is a good time to remind ourselves that Christianity didn't start in a building. The earliest Christians had no church building. They met They met in homes. They weren't confined to a building. They were out in the community. It wasn't until the year 313, when Christianity became the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire, that Christians started worshiping in sanctuaries. And so, landowner or gardener, how will we discern a faithful path forward for the fig tree of Beaumont Presbyterian Church? I don't know. What's really important to understand is that that's not my question to answer. It's only a question that this congregation can answer for itself. And another important thing to understand is this. There is no path forward that doesn't involve change. I'm going to repeat that sentence. There is no path forward that doesn't involve change. Even if this congregation decides to do nothing different, change will find us. So the question then is this. What change do we want? What change do we feel the Spirit is calling us to tackle? What change will bear the fruit that God is calling us to bear? What change do we feel God is calling us that maintains the integrity of the core DNA of this congregation? So I invite you all in this moment, that's perhaps an anxious one, that's perhaps an uncertain one, to rest in the truth that today's parable is open-ended, right? The parable ends right where I ended. We don't know the ending. Did the fig tree survive? We don't know. Did it wither and die? We don't know. That ending has yet to be written. 
And we might just be surprised by what that ending might be, and we might just be surprised by what finds us when we get there. This is the season of Lent. It's the time when we prepare for death. It's the time when we walk alongside Jesus Christ to a very rough place, a place fraught with uncertainty and pain and lament, but, but we rest in the knowledge that on the other side of that uncertainty, on the other side of that pain and lament is resurrection. Not resuscitation, right? Resuscitation is simply bringing back to life exactly what it was like before. A resuscitation of this congregation would be magically transforming it back to the glory days of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And friends, that just ain't going to happen. So if resuscitation isn't an option, resurrection is. We look forward to resurrection, something new something that challenges us, something that perhaps we've never seen before, something wild and free, something we can't, uh, that we can't control. The fate of the fig tree is in our hands, and more importantly, it's in the hands of God. And we all share, I believe this, we all share a very deep, deep love for this congregation. Some of us may think that it's the landowner, that the, the landowner option is needed. Others may think that the gardeners is the way to go. But let us remind ourselves that both the landowner and the gardeners want the same thing, even if they have different plans for it. And so, my dear friends, as we continue this process of discernment, let us trust in the mutual love that we all share for this congregation, no matter how short or for how long we've been a part of it. And let us trust in the providence of the great gardener who calls us together to plant ourselves even in moments of anxiety and uncertainty, to plant ourselves in a place of resurrection. We breathe together and breathe out. Friends, I'm your pastor. Come talk to me if you want, if you feel, feel the need. I realize this was a tough sermon. It wasn't a particularly fun one for me to give either, but I hope that you all trust that it was a sermon that was given um, out of a deep, deep love I have for you all. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, may all of us, God's beloved children, say, Amen. Amen.